We're recording. Warm up says to find uh, the decay rate for f of x if f of x is equal to 3 times 0.73x. First of all, we know it's going to be decay because the base is what? Less than 1. And what is the base? 0.73, right? So is the decay rate 73%? No, 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 no. The decay rate is not 73%. It's what? 27%. It's the difference from 73%. And 100%, which is 27%. Okay. And what is 0.73, just for kicks and giggles? What do we call 0.73 besides the base? It's not the decay rate. It's the decay factor, the decay factor. Okay, good. So the decay factor is the base factor. That is 0.73. Yeah. 0.73 is the base, which is also the decay factor. If I increase X by 1, I get another factor of 0.73. Every time I increase x by 1, I get another factor of 0.73 times 0.73 times 0.73 times 0.73. That's why we call it the decay uh, factor. Yeah, okay, good. Um, hey, and then there was a knock upon the door. Maybe it's Santa. Oh, Santa, I just can't wait for you to come. I just can't wait for you to come because I got cookies, three yummy cookies, just for you for when you come. Oh, just for you for when you come because it's Christmas. Veggie Tales, anyone? No one. Veggie Tales was dope, man. It was the stuff was good. The songs were so catchy. Silly songs with Larry. I still watch. I'll be flipping through channels on Sunday morning and on the Christian Network. They were showing Veggie Tales, and I'll 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 find myself like watching it for like thirty minutes. My wife's like, "Are you singing silly songs with Larry?" And I'm like, "I sure am." You should check it out. Good stuff. All right. Um, example four. Tell whether each of the population models is exponential growth or exponential decay. Uh, and then find the growth decay rates for each of them. Use the model to predict the current population. And then compare the number to the actual current population. So are they the same? Why or why not? Okay. So one of the things that we, again, use exponential equations for is to model things that exhibit exponential growth. And we said in the very beginning of uh, 7 or 4.1 that populations exhibit exponential growth, right? Because the more people you have, the more people you're going to get. Um, so here is a population model for San Jose, California. The nickname for San Jose is Sunny San Jose. The weather there is beautiful. People like living in sunny San Jose, California. So P of T, P is the population at time T. Uh, in years from 1990, um, we got 782248 times 1.0136 to the teeth power. First of all, is this going to be a growth or decay model? Growth. growth. What is the base? 1.0136. Okay. Yeah, that's also known as then the growth what? Factor. The GF is 1.0136. Now, because it's bigger than one, we know it's growth. So that means the population of San Jose is growing. Now, this is an, an example that was taken from real life data. I don't have the, the, the data, but it was taken from census information starting in 1990. So we can conclude then from this model that the population of San Jose in 1990 was what? 782,248. We can conclude that that is the initial value at t equals zero, which corresponds to 1990. And then from there, the population has grown. What would be the growth rate? Um, 1.36%. 1.36%. Very good. You convert the, uh, the growth factor to a uh, percentage by multiplying by 100. Move the decimal two places to the right. That gives you 101.36. And unlike the warm-up, we had to just find the difference from 100 uh, by, bless you, subtracting. This one, uh, or subtracting it from 100, this one we subtract 100 from it because it's bigger. So it's a little bit easier to find, right? It's just the, the residual there. Yeah, it, you always use 100. So in the warm-up, we subtracted from 100 because our, our value is smaller. And in this one, our value is bigger, so we subtract 100 from it. That's what we do, okay? Um, <clears throat> now, the question is, what's the current population? So let, let's figure out this. If 1990 corresponds to T equals zero, then 2023 corresponds to T equals what? 33. 
Okay, so what we want to do is we want to figure out what is P of 33. Now, there's a couple ways to do it. I can just type it in by hand into the home screen, 782, 248, blah, blah, blah. But I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to go to Y equals, and I'm going to type this in, 782, 248 times 1.0136 carat to the X power. And then I'm going to go to the window and manually adjust it. I'm going to let my X min equal zero. I'm going to let my X max equal, I'm going to say 50. I'm going to go 50 years past 1990. That puts us in 2040. Um, for my Y min, since I'm measuring people, I'm going to put zero. And then for a max, let's see. If it's 782 now, how about 1 million? You want to try 1 million for a max? We know it's growing. So one with six zeros after it. And that's all we need to do. If we hit graph, whoa. Yeah, it's a baby graph. What do I need to do here? I need to increase my window. I need to look up higher because it's exiting the top of the screen. I need to look up higher. So I need to go way past a million people. Well, let's go to two million. Man, San Jose is growing fast. There you go. You want it to exit off the right side of your screen, not the, not the vertical side of your screen. So you can tell it that's curved, right? It almost looks straight, but it is curved because the base is just slightly bigger than one. It, it's curved very, very gently in the beginning. Now, in the long run, that thing's going to eventually curve up pretty steep. But for, for now, in this 50-year span, it's a gentle, gently increasing curve, and it's still exponential. Okay, so now I can hit trace and type in 33, since I had my window included 33, and I get 1, 2, 2, 1, 6, 3, 7. So that's 1,221,637. Remember the other way to find this value, if you didn't want to do it from the graphing screen, <clears throat> using the trace button, you could quit and go to the home screen and do alpha trace, let me try that again, alpha trace number one of 33. And you get the answer that way as well. That way you don't have to even mess with the graph. You don't have to mess with the window. You could just go, I'm just interested in calculating it. All right. But it was nice to kind of manually go through the process of, of fitting a window to it. All right. Now, um, how in the world can we check what the current population of San Jose is? We need an encyclopedia for that, don't we? Or an almanac at the least? Does anyone? Did anyone bring their California almanac with them? How in today's day and age can we freaking figure out the population of San Jose, California? Look it up. Where? In the almanac? I didn't bring my almanac. Oh, in Safari. Oh, you're talking about an application. What? What is it? As of 2021. Okay. So, yeah, we, we Googled it. Right. We Googled it. That, that's yeah. You, you have no idea how lucky you are just to be able to Google something. Um, did our model predict it correctly? I mean, we're, we're a couple of years off 2021. We can actually figure out 2021 if we want to compare apples to apples. Um, let, let's do that real quickly. 2021 would be P of 31. Right. So alpha trace number one of 31. We get 1189074. Yeah, so we're still a little bit off there. Our model kind of over predicted what the population of sunny San Jose would be, right? 20, 31 years later. Um, so does that mean our model's no good? No. If you work for like the city and you're a city planner and you want to use past data that gave you this equation, you can actually use data from 1990 all the way up to like 2000, you can take every year data and come up with this model and you can predict what, what, how many people are going to be in your city in the future. And then you can, hey, how about this? Plan ahead of time so that you have the resources and infrastructure there to accommodate all the people that are coming. Or you build a wall and say, leave, right? Like New Braunfels, go back to California, leave New Braunfels, New Braunfels, right? But what, 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 what are some of the reasons why um, the population is actually, in actuality, less than what the model predicted. What's that? Carrying capacity, right? Maybe the city itself has, they ran out of real estate, right? And you just, you can't have as many people living there because, or, or maybe the housing market couldn't keep up with it. New, new construction couldn't keep up with it. 
Uh, but physical barriers, right? There's a lot of things, right? Economic, there could be unforeseen economic trends. You could have had part of San Jose sliding off into the Pacific Ocean, right? And they could have lost land. There, there could be a lot of different things. In actuality, there's so many variables that go into um, what makes the city grow and what makes the city not grow. And of course, over a 31 year period, we don't know when the last data was taken. It started in 1990. If this was data taken from 1990 to 2000, we're still predicting 21 years past the last data point. So remember, the further out you go past your last data point, you're extrapolating um, a little bit too far that maybe the model is useful. Let's say this data was taken from 1990 to 2000. This would have been good then to predict maybe what the population would be in 2001 or maybe even 2005, but maybe not all the way to 2023. You would need to collect more data, right? But anyway, it gives you an idea of how exponential models can be used. They can be used to forecast or predict, okay, with, with, with marginal accuracy, right? And again, if you always want to be more accurate, just take more data points. All right, questions on sunny San Jose? All right, let's look at another city, Detroit, Michigan. <clears throat> this one, uh, the model that I found, corresponded back to 1980. And uh, what was the initial population of Detroit in 1980, according to this model? 1,200,000. It was what the predicted population of San Jose was supposed to be uh, this year. So Detroit, Michigan was a much bigger city. Many, many people living in Detroit, Michigan. But alas, as you can notice, this model is exponential what? Growth or decay? Decay. People were actually leaving Detroit, Michigan. Do y'all know why? It could be a bad place, right? Crime rates could be really, really high. And because the lions suck. And so they want to go. They're actually pretty good this year. But yeah, they were they were they were historically bad. People were like, oh, let's get out of town. That's that's kind of funny. Uh y'all are probably too young to remember when the the auto Detroit, Michigan is Motor City, USA. There's all kinds of automobile uh, manufacturing plants there. It's, it's the auto, auto capital of the world. And uh, there was an auto bus in the early 2000s. And the federal government had to come in and rescue um, some of these big automakers from, from going bankrupt. Not that they would have gone bankrupt, but they were going to lay off a lot of people. It was going to plummet the economy. So the federal government stepped in and saved them. But Detroit, Michigan, people left because the economy busted there. And I think that it's being revitalized currently, but I, there are still places in Detroit, Michigan, where you can go into and find entire, what were once thriving neighborhoods, just abandoned. There's still places in Detroit where it's abandoned. It's, it's of course, everything will come back, but it takes a while. So this was, uh, this was exponential decay. Um, what would be the, uh, what would be the, oops, I'm running with a highlighter. What would be the decay factor? 0 0.9858. Now, if you're wondering how we can get the decay rate, it's very similar to the warm-up. I'm going to convert that to a, a decimal, which is 98.58. And because it's less than 100, I need to subtract it from 100. So if I just put minus 100, I get a negative number, but I know 1.42 is what I want. 98.58 minus 100. Take the absolute value of it, and you get 1.42. So um, Detroit was actually decaying its population at a rate that was greater than San Jose was growing. So that tells you one thing, huh? Possibly. Were all the people that were leaving Detroit, were they going to San Jose? Not all of them. I don't think that could possibly be because the rates are different. But maybe some of them. Probably most of them came to New Braunfels, Texas, right? Probably most of them came to New Braunfels, Texas. It'd be interesting to come up with some data from New Braunfels, Texas over the last 20, 30 years. It was historically this, this corridor, especially between San Antonio and Austin, is one of the fastest growing places in the, in the nation. Uh, let's, see, let's, let's figure out what the, according to the model, uh, what would the population be today? So uh, from 1980 to, 19, uh, to 2023 is how many years? 
33 again? 43 years. So uh, let's go to Y equals, and uh, I'm going to turn this one off, and I'll turn the other one on. So I get 1, 2, 0, 3, 3, 6, 8 times 0.9858 to the X power. And I should probably go to my window, and I've got 50 included in there, so that's fine. Let's leave it at 2 million. And you, the window the window for San Jose works out to be a good window for Detroit as well. But you can clearly see now that the curve is decreasing, right? The population is going down according to the model. And if you want, since 43 is in my window, I can just hit trace 43, and I get 650605. Or you could go to the home screen again and go alpha trace number one of 43. Yeah, alpha trace number two. Thank you. Alpha trace number two of 43. Thank you. I'm so used to doing alpha trace number one. But we do have our equation in Y2. I kept it in Y1. Uh, six, five, you get the same answer. Okay, now, again, we take out our almanacs and we Google it. And uh, do you have the actual population? Is it, does it say as of? As of today. So that's as of 2023. This model is pretty close, right? And again, I, I don't know when the last data was taken. This data from nine, that started in 1980, it might have been a 10-year period. It might have been a 20-year period. I don't really remember. But uh, we're predicting out to 2023 when certainly the data did not uh, go out that far. And we get something that's pretty, pretty close. Our model predicts that there's actually more people in Detroit um, and there's actually fewer people in Detroit. So maybe, maybe the, the, this, I don't think this data up here from 1980 takes into account the auto bust. Okay. There are people who were leaving Detroit before the auto industry kind of collapsed. Um, so, and, and, and this is, includes the, the recent revitalization in the last five years. So uh, Detroit suffered a bigger, bigger loss, but it's, it's on the men now. I think if you were to look at uh, Detroit over the last five years, You'll see the trend is rising. It's it's gonna it's back to growth instead of decay. Tis the cycle of life, right? It ebbs and flows, highs and lows. All right. Um, comments or questions? Exponential models. Okay, we have relevant domains. The domain of all exponentials is all real numbers, but in this case, our domain uh, was zero to fifty, right? So we restricted the domain, and then we we look at restricted ranges. <clears throat> okay, so remember exponential growth and decay models are appropriate for any type of behavior in the real world where the growth or decay rate is directly proportional to the current amount, where the situation of the more you have, the more you get, or the less you have, the less you lose, lose is, um, is there. Okay, so let's, let's look at bacteria. This is a really common thing. Scientists grow bacteria. They grow things in a Petri dish, and they, they count the number of bacteria cells in this dish, okay? A small culture of 10 bacteria, so just 10 little bacteria cells, is placed in a Petri dish. Suppose that the culture of bacteria doubles every hour. That's pretty fast, right? Bacteria reproduce rapidly. They double every hour. After how many hours will the number of bacteria reach 500,000? This example is to get you to really appreciate the power of exponential growth. It's pretty slow in the beginning, isn't it? It's pretty slow in the beginning, but as you go out to the right, that curve is going to increase at an increasing rate, and it's going to get pretty steep, okay? So if you double 10, you go from 10 to 20. But if you double 500,000, you go from 500,000 to a million. So instead of just gaining 10, you gain half a million in, in the same amount of time. That's phenomenal, okay? That's why time value of money is so important. The earlier you invest exponentially, then when you're older, you're, you're doubling larger and larger amounts, okay? So keep that in mind as you start investing or saving. Um, we could do this kind of just by counting on our fingers. Do you want, want to do that? It goes from 10 to 20. That's one. I have one finger up. 20 to 40. That's two fingers. 40 to 80. That's three fingers. 80 to 160. That's, do you want to do it this way? No, I don't want to do it that way. So here's, here's the best way to do it. If I can come up with a model that represents how fast this stuff grows, then I can set it equal to 500,000 and solve. Okay, so let's let the amount of bacteria at any given time be T. 
or a, sorry, a, as a function of time t, okay, where t equals zero hours is the initial bacteria, which is how many? 10, so that's our a value, 10 times. Now, what would be a good base to use if the bacteria doubles? Two, and if it doubles every hour, what would be the exponent? X or, in this case, T. Yeah. That's a real simple model, right? 10 times 2 to the teeth power. Now what I want to do is I want to set it equal to 500,000. And I want to solve for T. <clears throat> now, when we learn about logs in the next section, we'll know how to solve this algebraically. But right now, we don't know how to undo exponentials. And I'm not going to teach you about logs just yet because there's a whole chapter waiting for that. So we're going to solve this graphically. How do we do that? We graph this in y1, we graph this in y2, and we look to see where they intersect. So go back to your calculator. I'm just going to clear all these out. I thought I'd save them for next period, but I'll just type them in again. All right, so I'm going to type in y1, 10 times 2 to the x, and then down here I'm going to put 500,000. Oh, I forgot how many zeros I put. Five, zero, 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 zero. Okay, now we need to go to our window. I'm going to start at zero because that's my T min. The domain goes all the way to negative infinity, but I'm starting at my relevant starting point of zero. And let's see, how many hours do you want to let go by? This is where we kind of guess a little bit. Is, is 50 hours a good place to start? That's where I happen to have it. Yeah, yeah let's, let's leave it at 50. We can always adjust that. Uh, you can skip the Y scale, X scale, Y min. I'm going to leave that at zero because that's population of bacteria. I know we start at 10. Zero is the X axis. And I'm trying to see where it reaches 500,000. So I at least want to go to something that includes 500,000. I'm going to switch it. I'm going to go back to a million. In other words, that's going to put my horizontal line of 500,000 right in the middle of my screen, won't it? which is nice. You, you could also put 700,000. That would be fine. Now, when I hit graph, do I see it? Everything I want to see? Yeah, 50 was actually too much, wasn't it? You can see that it exits the top of the screen, so 50 was actually too much. I could have scaled it down to something less than that, but I see the information that I'm looking for. I see the blue graph, which it looks like it's the x-axis for a while, doesn't it? And then all of a, stun all of a sudden, Almost like lightning, it goes from what appears to be a horizontal line to a very steep line that's approaching a vertical line very, very rapidly. Okay? That is the power of exponential growth. It goes from horizontal to vertical exponentially. What a great word to use. All right, now how do we find points of intersection? Second trace number five, second trace number five, enter, enter, enter. There's only one point of intersection. So underneath here, we'll put T equals. 15.609 or 15.610, and we're going to put hours. Holy moly. I probably could have gotten there by counting on my fingers. It wouldn't have taken more than three hands, a little more than three hands. Now, how long will it take for the population to reach a million? Sixteen point six oh nine hours, right? In the very next hour, it's going to double again. So it reaches a million at sixteen point six oh nine hours. That's amazing. That is the true power of exponential growth. Okay. Now I think I told y'all before. I don't know if I have, but I, I I understand the power of bacterial growth exponentially firsthand when I had. My knee, I've had several knee surgeries. I've had nine knee surgeries on my right knee. Two for, rep for to repair a meniscus and an ACL. But the other seven were because it got infected and the bacteria in there were growing so rapidly. Um, I, I, I was in so much pain, but they had to go in there and try and get rid of the bacteria. And the bacteria was so, so strong that, that, that uh, it took several surgeries to go in there with a pressure washer and get it all out several times. But I remember one time it, it was I was sitting at home watching the unicorn football game. I, I worked the chains at the time 
And so I wasn't working the chains, but it was a televised game. It was Thursday Night Lights, baby. And I was watching Mr. Wenzel and his buddies and the guy that was taking my place work the chains. And I, I, I was starting at home with my leg up. First game that I had missed like in 15 years. And I'm sitting at home with my leg up and I'm watching the game and I'm feeling good in the first quarter. You know, nothing wrong. Second quarter, my knee starts to tickle a little bit. Like, coochie coo tickle. I'm like, that's kind of a weird sensation in my knee. I just had surgery about a week ago um, to repair the ACL. Um, so my, 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 my wounds from the surgery had already kind of healed shut, you know. Um, but they were still there. And, and then by the fourth quarter, I was actually in a lot of pain in my knee. A lot of pain. And then by the time my wife got home from the game, I was like in agony. And I said, something's wrong with my knee. I, I think this is not right. So we went to the uh, emergency room. And by the time I got to the emergency room, they triage you, you know. They didn't take me right back. There were other people there with like tummy aches and stuff. And I was sitting in the waiting room. And I had, I had seen my knee at this point s swell up. There was actually like fluid in my knee. And my knee looked like a balloon that was inflated. And I was in so much pain and they hadn't taken me back yet. So I kid you not, I went into the restroom and my wife went with me. And to alleviate some of the pressure, I actually just pushed on that balloon as hard as I could. And bacteria juice squirted out from three of my surgical incisions. <laughs> And I was like, oh, my gosh, it's working. So I kept milking my knee and squeezing it. And more and more bacteria juice kept going. <laughs> coming out of my knee until I had my knee pretty much back down to regular size. And I was like, oh, gosh, I feel so much better. And that was lucky for me because it took them another 20 minutes before they brought me back. And it had already filled back up a little bit. And I remember Dr. Templin, who was on call, Dr. Templin, he says, we got a gusher. And they then and then and then after that, they, the IV was in and I was in surgery and they, they went in there and they cleaned it with the pressure washer. And I stayed in the hospital for a week on IV antibiotics. And that it came back. It kept coming back. So they had to they had to do it several times. But that was the worst. And and I tell you, again, it took from the first quarter where I felt the tickle at the end of the first quarter to my wife coming home and it already inflated like a balloon. And that's how fast the bacteria was growing inside of my knee. Now it had probably been infected several days prior, right? Since the surgery, but it was slow growth in the beginning. And I was just at the sweet spot right there. You can see the bend in the blue graph. The bend in the blue graph happens in a very, very small X window right there. That's where it starts to curve really rapidly. That was where I was watching the football game, right there. So the surgery happened here. It was infected, but it didn't matter. Boom, that's where it swelled up. And then right there, maybe at the point of intersection, is, is when I'm in the bathroom milking my knee. Yeah. This, I, I pressed so hard that those surgical scars that had already closed, they burst back open. And just, <laughs> I feel sorry for the nurse that had to go in there and clean the restroom. She was, it was a disaster. We try to clean up as much as we can, but they have to disinfect it, you know. You can't you don't want people going in there just like, what's all this juice on the wall, right? It was gross. It was gross. But had they gotten me back a little bit sooner and given me uh, you know, the taking me in for emergency surgery, I wouldn't have had to destroy their restroom. But anyway, <laughs> that's my story about exponential growth. Fun, 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 good stuff. All right. Um, not all bacteria is bad, though, right? Bacteria in your stomach is good. It helps you digest your food. <clears throat> okay. Um, I've got a story about bacteria in my stomach, too, actually creeping back up into my esophagus and getting into my lungs and getting aspiration pneumonia and getting what's called an empyema in the back. And I had to have an emergency thoracotomy to save my life. But that's another story. No, from my stomach. The good bacteria in my stomach worked its way back up my esophagus down into my windpipe. It got into my lungs and it manifested there and I didn't know it. And it grew 
and it worked its way outside my lungs, forming a sack of pus outside my lung that was causing me to have constant muscle spasms. And they, they, they had to go in there through my back. I have this huge scar on my back where they deflate the lung and they pressure wash it out. And then I was in, I, I, I was in critical ICU for, for 13 days. Yeah, yeah. And they said if I'd had one more risk factor, like if I would have been fatter than I am now, or, or if I was a smoker or a drinker, one more risk factor might have been enough to take my life. But it wasn't my time. It was just another time that I battled the exponential growth of bacteria, and I won. I fought bacteria, and I won. And I'm living proof. But here, I'll tell you this. It grows fast. It grows fast. Exponential growth, you don't want to mess with it. If your money can grow exponentially as fast as bacteria can, that's a good thing. So keep that in mind as you're investing early and young, okay? Example six. Oh, back to bacteria. <laughs> What if the initial bacteria culture from example five? Do y'all remember that one? Do y'all remember the bacteria that we just talked about? What instead of what is what instead of doubling every hour? What if it tripled every two hours? What if it tripled every two hours? Is that a little bit faster? A little slower? It's one. Yeah, it's a little bit slower. After how many hours would it take for the population to reach five hundred thousand? What would the model be? If the population tripled, not every two hours, but every seven hours or every day or every 20 minutes, I'm going to show you how you can just adjust this model up here. So this is, this is a, well, let's write up here, we'll put a double every hour, colon. And from above, we know that it was 10 times 2 to the teeth power. Now we want it to triple every two hours. So what's going to be the same? Well, A of T is going to be the same. Yes, yes. What about 10, the initial population? Is that going to be the same? That'll be the same. What would be a good base to use if it's tripling instead of doubling? No. Tripling. Don't, don't try to do it every hour and having the base. It doesn't work that way. That's only if it's linear. This is exponential. So if something's tripling, we still want the growth factor to be three, okay, which is the base. Now, here's where we take into account it's every two hours. It's not to the teeth power. It's not to the teeth power because that would be every one hour. What, what I want, yeah, to the one-half T, very good. What I want it to be is like every multiple of two, I want to get another factor of three. So not every hour, but every two hours. So all I have to do is take my exponent, t, and divide it by two or multiply it by a half. Now notice when t is two, two divided by two is one, and I get three to the first. There's your tripling factor. Another two hours goes by when t is four. What's four divided by two? Two. I get my second tripling factor, so on and so forth. Okay? So that should work. If it's every two hours, divide your exponent by two. Okay, what if I want it now to triple? It says every seven hours. What would it be? A of t is equal to what? 10 times, what's a good base if it's still tripling? Three. Well, what would the exponent be? Uh, t divided by not half, but if it's every seven hours, it would be t divided by seven. Yeah. Now every multiple of seven you're getting another integer factor of three. So you see what we're doing there? We're just doing t divided by n, where n is the number of hours it takes to triple. Okay, what about this one? What if it triples every day, every one day? One day is how many hours? 24 hours. So that would be a of t equals 10 times three to the what? t divided by 24. Now, let's think about what each of these are doing to my graph that I'm still seeing here. When you multiply on the inside of the function by a half or something less than one, does that horizontally stretch or horizontally compress the graph? Um, horizontally compress or stretch. It's the opposite of what it appears, right? So it's not one half as wide. It's twice as wide. 
this graph for t divided by 7 is 7 times wider. The graph of t divided by 24 is 24 times wider. So what that's doing is grabbing this blue graph here and it's stretching to the right, which essentially makes it flatter, doesn't it? And the flatter it is, the slower the growth is. So y'all are right in y'all's original consideration, right? Where even though it's tripling, it's slowing down the growth every time you say every seven hours, every 24 hours. And we know that that should be true because it's more time, but it takes the graph and stretches it horizontally. Now, what if it triples every 20 minutes? 20 minutes is what fraction of an hour? It's a third of an hour. So I should have A of T equals 10 times 3 to the T divided by a third. Well, what's T divided by one third? T divided by one third. That's T times 3 over 1, isn't it? State change flip. So 3T. Now, what would that do to my graph when I multiply it by three? Would it horizontally stretch or compress it? Uh, it would compress it by a factor of three, which makes it steeper, which makes it grow faster. Is that what we want it to do when it's every 20 minutes? Yeah. So you can see how the transformation there is affected by what's really intuitive in terms of what we want to have happen there. Okay. Um, now, to answer the last question, what would it be? If I set my second model here equal to 500,000, I get T equals, let's go ahead and type that in. Go to Y equals. And instead of 2 to the X, we'll type it as 3 to the X divided by tooth power. And we'll just hit graph again. Second trace, number 5, enter, enter, enter. And we get... It takes a little bit longer, 19.697 hours. 19.697. And, and you, 500,000, I put 5,000. Oops. There we go. And you can do the same type of thing for any of these, okay? What if, what if I wanted it not to triple every seven hours, but what if I wanted it to quadruple every seven hours? The only thing that would change now is the base, right? It would be 10 times 4 to the t divided by 7. So there's two things that you have control over when you're writing these equations. What's the growth factor? What is the base? And that should be given to you, triples, doubles, whatever. That should be your base. And then every whatever is t divided by the time it takes for that to happen. Okay? t divided by whatever time it takes for that to happen. All right. So... If you want, you could say uh, A of T equals A sub zero, and then B, where B is your uh, growth or decay factor, okay, times T divided by N, where N is the number, uh, or the time, I should say, N is the time to reach your scale factor. If it triples every three days, or let's say if it triples every five days, N would be five and B would be three, so on and so forth. Okay, so you can modify both of those. All right, let's, let's change gears here a little bit. Instead of giving the scale factor, let's go ahead and take a look at what happens if we're given the percentage. Example seven. Determine the exponential model of the form A times B to the T that satisfies the following conditions. Define the units that you're going to use for T. All right. So the initial value is 7. And now instead of saying it's doubling every often or tripling every so often, we're saying it increases at a rate of 32% per day. Is that still exponential? Yeah, it is. Anything that increases by a constant scale factor or by a constant percentage is still going to be exponential. Okay. so. Um, Let's go ahead and say A of T equals our initial value of 7. So that should go next, right? It's increasing, so it should be growth, right? I need to come up with the base. How do I go from my growth rate to my growth factor? 
Move it to a decimal, so 32% is 0.32, and do what with it? Add it to 1. Yeah, remember when we said at the top it was 1 plus or minus R to the teeth power. So that would be 1.32. So it's increasing by a factor of 1.32 every day. So what do you want to use for your units? You want to have it just be T and let T equal days? Yeah, we could do that. If you do T equal days, then you could do T divided by 1. If it does that every one day, T divided by 1 is just T. What if I wanted to measure it in hours? Good. Then I could say 1.32 to T divided by 24, but then I say T is in hours. What if I wanted to do it in years? Yeah, well, it would be T divided by It would be times or divided by? Well, divided by 1 over 365 or times would be divided by. Every day. So one day is equal to 1 365th of a year. Would, it, would the curve be... Um, yeah, well, if we, let's see, when we went to smaller, this is where we want to think. When we went to smaller units, it's T divided by 24. If we're going to bigger units, 365T. Yeah, let's think about that because we're dividing by 1 over 365, 365T. Three yeah, that would make your graph compressed because if we're going out one year, the graph has to be compressed to fit into that time period. Yeah. Okay. All right. So are the units important? Yes. T is going to be in years. The units are important. So this is something to consider when you yourself are assigning a mathematical model to some real life situation, whether it's in statistics class or in your science class, you want to really clearly define what your units are. The units for A is, of course, whatever the units that we're measuring, population of bears, bacteria, whatever. But the time units are very, very important. Okay, let's look at uh, letter B. The initial value is 427. So we could start by saying A of T equals 427. And now it's decreasing by a rate of 0.427 per year. Yeah, so this is my decay rate. How do I find the decay factor? Well, first I got to do what I did up above here, right? I got to convert it to a decimal first. So how do I convert that to a decimal? Do I move the decimal to the right two places or left two places? Left. left. So it's 0 0.00427. As Peyton said in the very beginning, it's very, very small. And because it's decreasing, what do I do? Do I add that to one or subtract it from one? Subtract it from one. So here's my little r right there. Let's find it on the calculator. One. Minus 0 0.00427. You get R is equal to 0 0.99573. So I'll bring that over here. That's my decay factor. Uh, I'll just put in parentheses 0 0.99573. And it's per year. So what would be the most obvious unit to use? To call it T divided by 1 and let T equal what? Years, yeah. What if we wanted to measure it in? Um, what if we wanted to measure it in decades? Uh, do we do we usually use decades? No. Well, let's try it. Let's let let's let T be in decades. It would be four twenty seven, and then point nine nine five seven three. Well, the question would be, would it be divided by 10 or times 10? It would be times 10. Good. When you're going to a unit that's bigger, if you haven't noticed, when you're going to a unit that's bigger, 
it's going to end up being multiplied. When you're going to a unit that's smaller, it's going to be divided by. Or if it's the same, if it's the same unit, but it's, it's less often, okay, or more often, I should say. All right, initial value of 18, quadrupling every four minutes. So A of T would be 18 is the initial value. What's a good base if it's quadrupling? Uh, four. four. And it's, if it's every 13 minutes and we use minutes for our units, which is the kind of the intuitive thing to do, it would be 13T or T divided by 13? No, it would be T divided by 13. Well, no, I'm talking about if you change units, like if you go from minutes to hours. Oh. Or, yeah, if you go from minutes to hours, it would be divided by, if you go from minutes to seconds, it would be multiplied. But if we're using the same value of minutes and it's not one, we divide by that number. Notice, notice says how this works. When t is zero, we get zero divided by 13, which is zero. I get, I get 18. Um, oops, I put, I wrote that wrong. I wrote it kind of like a polynomial, like a hybrid. Didn't I? That should that T on the base should not be there. That was confusing me. There it is. When T is zero, I get four to the zero power, which is one. I get 18. When T is 13, 13 minutes later, what's 13 divided by 13? One. I get my first full factor of four, 13 minutes. Another 13 minutes later, when T is 26, what's 26 divided by 13? Two. I get my second full factor. Okay, that's how that works. All right, now that's as far as we have time to get today. Um, we'll start with 7D tomorrow. We got through 7C. 7C. All right. Good stuff.